Okay, thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, we had to iron out a few Zoom um, kinks before getting started, but we'd like to welcome you to the Southampton Seminar Series. This is our um, November sem seminar. We'll have one more this semester. So let me talk about our final semester first before I introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, and my name is uh, Dr. Kurt Bretsch. I'm SOMAS faculty based here at Southampton. And that's all I need to say about myself. Um, I will say that one of our other SOMAS Southampton faculty members, Dr. Joe Warren, will be giving our final seminar of the semester. So this will actually be on Friday, December 3rd. We're gonna be doing our windmill lighting ceremony this fall. Uh, many of you folks from the local community really enjoy this, this event. It's been a tradition for decades here at the Southampton campus. So we're very pleased to be able to offer that again. The university is very happy um, to, offer, to offer this ceremony again. Um, again, Friday, December 3rd. And that ceremony will start around 5, 5.30. Keep an eye open for announcements about that ceremony. At the end of the windmill ceremony, we'll have our final seminar speaker at 7.30 p.m. in this room. And that's going to be Dr. Joe Warren, as I said, and he'll be discussing, or the title of his seminar, I should say, is Whale Watching from the Beach. How are New York whales reacting to a changing environment? So again, we hope you can join us for that seminar at 7.30 on Friday, December 3rd. Tonight though, we're very pleased to have Dr. Joyce Novak join us for our November seminar. Joyce is the executive director of the Peconic Estuary Partnership. And the Peconic Estuary Partnership has recently been hosted by SOMAS and Stony Brook University. So Joyce is doing a lot of interesting things with her institution, with the partnership and colleagues um, within SOMAS and at the university. Um, and she's an adjunct faculty member within SOMAS. So I'm very excited to hear what Joyce has to uh, tell us about in terms of updates that the partnership has been doing in the last uh, year and a half or so. There's some exciting things on the horizon and uh, without much further ado, let's welcome Dr. Joyce Novak. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so yeah, I am Joyce Novak, the director of the Peconic Estuary Partnership. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the national estuary programs in the United States, a um, little bit about how they operate and how the Peconic one operates here on the east end of Long Island. Um, and then I'm going to dive right into uh, what we do. Uh, and we do a wide range of things. Um, from clean water projects to habitat projects to community-based projects. So um, I hope there's a little something for everyone. Um, so the National Estuary Program, what is that? Um, the United States Environmental Protection Agency back in the 80s initiated a program called the National Estuary Program, whereby states could nominate uh, estuaries of national significance. This had to be initiated and put forward by state governors, um, and it created a framework for the protection, the monitoring, um, and the conservation of estuaries around the United States. This designation is under Section 320 of the Clean Water Act. Um, and so therefore, our, our mission really uh, is born out of the Clean Water Act and has to do directly with cleaning water. So for the Peconics, we came to be uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, after the brown tide blooms uh, destroyed a lot of uh, habitat and wildlife in the Peconic waters, uh, both the marine waters uh, and the river, you know, up the estuary waters. Um, and it was really led by Suffolk County at the time, um, who very strongly wanted this to be listed as an estuary of national significance. So they approached Congress uh, with the then governor of the state of New York uh, to go down this road, and they were successful. Um, so it is funded, our base funding is through the EPA. Um, we are non-regulatory, which means we develop strategies. We work with local and state partners to uh, carry out management plans, um, but we do not have an enforcement arm. Um, and we are place-based, obviously. The 28 programs around the country um, work very locally. Even the larger programs, like the Long Island Sound, where their watershed runs up to Canada, um, the majority of their management sits in Connecticut and the state of New York. 
Um, our restoration priorities are driven by our local communities and driven by our local boards of management and our technical advisory boards. Um, we are trusted, uh, a trusted place where both communities, uh, academic institutions, local governments and state governments can come together to find creative solutions to really complicated problems. Um, and so what does that mean here in the Peconics? It was in 1993, as I just said, um, before when I talked about uh, our designation, it was 1993. Again, it was born out of a response to the Brown Tide event, um, which had some really devastating impact on the Peconic watershed. Um, and we cover the watershed, which is delineated by our groundwater input into the system. And that's the blue line that you see there. Um, we're about 125,000 land acres, 158,000 surface water acres, 453 miles of shoreline. We have 100,000 year-round residents and 280,000 residents during the summer. I will make a note that that number is pre-2020. So we are trying to figure out how much that has changed uh, since the pandemic and what that likely looks like in the future. Um, as we are all aware, most of the homeowners and summer rental owners, um, the seasonal residents, I should say, um, rely on septic systems. So all of this has an impact in our watershed. Uh, formerly, we were hosted at Suffolk County. What does it mean to be a hosted organization? So the Peconic Estuary Partnership is not a non-governmental organization. It is not a standalone nonprofit. Um, so we need an entity who can help us service our funding that comes in um, and take care of things like contracts for us and other legal um, elements. So this year, uh, we were lucky enough to have SOMAS at Stony Brook um, submit paperwork to the EPA to request to host the Peconic Estuary Partnership. And they were, uh, it was a competitive bid and they were awarded it. So we're very excited to be here um, and to move forward with this partnership. Uh, how do we make our decision? So we are a consensus-based decision-making organization. That means we like in our committees to have everyone agree at the end of the day. It's an extremely difficult task for some things. Um, again, we have people from the state, from the federal government, from the local East End towns, and from Suffolk County, as well as nonprofit partners and community leaders on our boards. To get all these people together is not always an easy task, but collaboration is the key to our success. So our highest, this is just very brief, our highest governing bodies, we have a policy committee, um, and a management committee. And then under the management committee, we have technical advisory, local government and citizens advisory committees. All of these committees work within themselves to make recommendations up to the management committee for final approval to the policy committee. And the partnership office stands as the bedrock to all of these to facilitate all of the members of these committees um, to help us make decisions. Uh, in 2020, we updated our comprehensive conservation management plan this is our guiding document. This lays out what we want to do for the next 10 years and is really significant for us and for how we're gonna spend money at the end of the day. Uh, our four goals are clean waters for ecosystem health and safe recreation, healthy ecosystems and abundant diverse wildlife, strong partnerships and engagement and resilient communities prepared for climate change. So I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of what we do um, based on these four goals. Cause as I said, these goals are what guide us. So initially um, in 1993, when we set out down this course, um, as with other national estuary programs, we focused on point sources and direct discharges. So what does this mean? Looking at wastewater treatment plants, looking at uh, discharge pipes, places where we know things are going into the water and it's easy to put what we call a total maximum daily load onto those input sources. Um, nitrogen, um, nitrogen loading reduction, including the establishment of the vessel no waste, no discharge zone in 2002 was a cornerstone of the Peconic Estuary Program at the time. 
Um, and we supported Suffolk County in the fertilizer reduction law in 2007. Um, we also worked with EPA to develop the existing total maximum daily load for nitrogen in that currently exists in the Peconic waters. Um, and we worked closely with the Riverhead Sewage Treatment Plant when they did their upgrade several years back. Um, currently, we have a strong focus on non-point source and diffuse pollution via groundwater. So over the years, as more research was done, um, we realized that this is a groundwater fed system that we don't have problems that other areas have directly related to one large treatment plant that is maybe not doing its job or overtaxed. We have somewhat more insidious diffuse pollution via groundwater. This makes it much more difficult to pinpoint, much more difficult to clean and to come to very straightforward uh, solutions to. So initially, um, Around 2007, we developed 12 sub-watershed management plans for the Peconic Estuary to try and start looking at cost-effective strategies to help reduce pathogens from stormwater runoff and to improve water quality. Um, and then in 2015, um, we entered, we assisted the East End communities and municipalities along with Suffolk County and the Department of Transportation to enter an intermunicipal agreement to reduce stormwater. And we created what's called the Peconic Estuary Protection Committee. So this is all of those partners. It's a subset of this organization. And it's all of those partners uh, led by a coordinator um, who work specifically on stormwater pollution reduction. Um, and so just to dive a little bit into this, when we looked at the 12 subwatershed management plans, this was way back before Suffolk County had even started to develop their subwatershed management plan. And so we looked at 12 distinct areas um, that had high levels of pollution. They are listed on this map. I'm not gonna go into all of those plans, but they sort of guide uh, where we carried out work and what we did next. Um, still under the clean water heading, um, we have supported robust surface water quality monitoring in the Peconic Estuary. Uh, it was the federal funds for this program that helped to start Suffolk County's um, Marine Water Quality Program, which now the county has expanded tremendously uh, with their Bureau of Marine Services. Um, but there are still 38 Peconic surface water quality stations. We work closely with Suffolk County and the Marine Unit on this endeavor. Uh, we have also installed three continuous water quality monitoring stations, one in Riverhead, one in Orient, and we've just installed one in Shelter Island, and we were working to put equipment on that one. Um, and how are these different? So when the team goes out from Summit County and takes you know, water quality samples, they can't do that several times every day. They do that on a regular scale. And so we have snapshots in time from the data that they give us. But the USGS stations give us continuous flowing data, which is extremely important when we deal with things like fish kills, like scallop die-offs, and other major catastrophes that happen because we can look day and night. Uh, there are often very different readings during the daytime than at the nighttime and help to pinpoint um, reasons for, for these events. Um, PEP also participates in the National Atmospheric Deposition Program, which is also run by Suffolk County Bureau of Marine Services. Uh, we install or we joined up to the NADP program, National Atmospheric Deposition Program, in 2003. And if you go to that website, you can see all of the results um, of nitrogen and mercury deposition via air. Um, on the east end of Long Island, um, which is remarkably significant um, and something that is always a challenge on how to deal with um, because that's a much larger national issue. And so the second goal I talked about was healthy ecosystems and abundant diverse wildlife. Uh, in 2017, um, we upgraded our habitat restoration plan, which prioritizes our restoration projects. And since 2007, sorry, since 2000, 27 habitat restoration projects have been completed. Um, this pie chart just shows you the percentage of wetland, submerged aquatic vegetation and eelgrass projects. Uh, we consider diadromous fish projects uh, part of this. Um, 
And it is the plan was updated again in 2000 um, with some new priorities. So we're looking forward to moving into um, some more restoration projects as we move forward. Currently at the moment, uh, Dr. Brad Peterson is working with us to move forward some of the eelgrass work that we started uh, with him and with Caitlin O'Toole um, developing a bio-optical model for eelgrass. And he's continuing that to look at some of those um, sites that were targeted there. Uh, we are working um, with a group of residents and with Suffolk County and with DEC at Akabonic Harbor um, to look at wetland restoration there. Um, we will be funding um, uh, a conceptual design plan at Agabonic Harbor in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy um, to help move that project along. And the diagenous fish habitat I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, oh, I'll talk about it right now. <laughs> so we have supported fish paths and dam removal for the past several years. Dam removal itself is extremely complicated um, and is not something that is likely to happen uh, in the Peconic watershed. So we have chosen to really focus on fish paths around these dams. So supported, we have supported the improvement of populations of alewife, uh, which is river herring, um, by opening up 35 acres of freshwater habitat on the Peconic River as part of the Grandable Park Fishway Passage Project in 2010. If you go into Grandable Park uh, in May, in the evening, you can see the fish quite easily getting up and over this dam. Um, an Edwards Avenue fish pass was completed by DEC in 2016. You will notice that Edwards Avenue is here and Grandable is here. They are both completed, but we have to finish Upper Mills and Forge Road to allow the fish to have access to their complete habitat. So we are in the process of working on the Upper Mills Dam and the town of Brookhaven is in the process of um, completing the Forge Road fish dam. So it is my great hope over the next several years, the entire Peconic River will be open to uh, alewife and American eel migrating up this system. Over here, you'll see the tributary of the Peconic River. I think it's Little River. Uh, the Woodhall Dam sits here. November 1st, that contract went into effect and we will be constructing a fish pass here that uh, all going according to plan will be complete by the spring migration season. So we're really excited about that. Um, Back in 2012 and 13, we worked with uh, the town of East Hampton and some other partners on hard clam and American oyster enhancement and restoration in Lake Montauk. This involved growing and seeding a million clams, half a million oysters into Lake Montauk um, and help to promote their uh, seeding programs, which continue to this day. Um, in 2019, we completed the seagrass bio-optical model, which I was talking about before with Dr. Brad Peterson and Caitlin O'Toole. Um, and in 2021, uh, we began to fund work to field test the sites that were identified in this model. So we're, we're very excited um, about the possibility of restoration or habitat enhancement. Um, we were instrumental in Bullhead Bay, um, working with the Southampton trustees to designate this area as an eelgrass sanctuary, which prohibited shellfishing in the boundaries. Um, and since 1997, we have funded long-term monitoring of eelgrass throughout the watershed. Partnerships. In 2020, as part of our strategic management plan, uh, we changed our name from the Peconic Estuary Program to the Peconic Estuary Partnership. And we wanted this to reflect um, our, our heavy reliance and identification with our communities and with the East End towns. Um, we've been facilitating the homeowner rewards program, which to date has helped over 32 property owners since 2014 complete sustainable upgrades to their yards by installing native plant gardens, rain gardens, and putting in rain barrels. And while this doesn't sound like a lot, it's it's added 56,000 square feet of native plants, 3,300 square feet of rain gardens, and 46 rain barrels 
throughout our system. We will continue this project and next year we're going to expand this to schools um, in the hope that we can get a lot more people on board to understand the importance of stormwater management. We do a lot of work um, with our communities. So we have started to the past couple of years, uh, try and devote some time to uh, bilingual outreach. Uh, we had a lot, we have a lot of work to do um, on the diversity inclusion side. We are in the process of executing a contract to get a strategy underway to help us do this. Um, but to look out for that and reaching out to what we would consider communities who are not represented currently in our organization that we'd like to see there. Um, we developed a 10 mile Peconic River Blue Way Trail, uh, which is a trail marked along the Peconic River. If you'd like to take your kayak out, I will note there are one or two places where you have to lift your kayak up and over a barrier. <laughs> so we are still working on that. Um, and when we completed the Whittles Hole Living Shoreline Project, which I'll talk a little bit about next, um, we had local school children in Greenport come out and help us plant some of the eelgrass. So the goal, one of our strong partnerships and engagement goals means closer engagement with local governments, the management committee, the policy committee, and the local government committee. Um, the local government committee was had a resurgence in 2018 to help the towns really come together um, to have a voice in what the Peconic Estuary Partnership does. Um, so we formed this committee so that they would have a voice. Uh, the chair of this local government committee sits on our management board and is able to vote and help us make decisions. I talked a little bit about what we call the intermunicipal agreement for that protection committee who does stormwater work. Um, we set that up and we're, we actively engage with community preservation fund boards. In 2021, all of the East End towns committed to giving as is allowed under New York state law, a portion of the CPF funds to the Peconic Estuary Partnership for our goals of clean water. So we actively engage with the towns um, and all of their planning boards and environmental committees. And here's where we have two living shoreline projects. So when we talk about climate resiliency, one of the things that is really noticeable in the Peconics is the hardened shorelines. What seems to be, uh, you know, mile after mile of bulkheaded shoreline. Um, and from a climate resiliency perspective, this isn't a long-term solution. So what we're trying to do is establish pilot areas that can give people alternatives to bulkheading. So, We've worked with uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension at the Suffolk County Marine and Vital Learning Center that's here on the left to look at one in a very low energy environment. Uh, we'll be having a field trip out here November 19th, if anybody's interested in seeing the results where they've put together five different alternatives in low energy environments as alternative to bulkheads. And then Cornell also helped us uh, in Greenport at Widow's Hole uh, on a property that the land trust uh, had recently purchased, or sorry, was gifted to the land trust. It was part of the old ExxonMobil site in Greenport, um, where we completed, this was the first living shoreline project that was committed, completed in the Peconic Estuary. And it focused on a slightly more high energy environment. Um, and we're looking to do a phase two to this project as well. Um, this is just what this site looked like. You'll notice all of the Phragmites here and what this site looked like when we set out down the road um, with Cornell at the Suffolk County Marine Environmental Learning Site for that. Um, so also moving down the road of climate resiliency, we worked with the East End Towns and the Nature Conservancy to really put together uh, a map of all of the parcels of land, both publicly and privately held uh, developed and undeveloped an agriculture in our watershed to put together a climate ready assessment. We did a second climate ready assessment with the Shinnecock Indian Nation, um, which was for the entire delineation of the nation, not just the portion in our watershed. And so what did this do? This identified parcels um, 
that could potentially be prioritized by towns for acquisition if they were parcels that experienced extreme flooding, if they were parcels that were adjacent to wetlands, where wetlands could migrate as water levels rise. And we're working with the towns to make these kinds of decisions as we're seeing um, what seems like every year rapidly changing climatic conditions. Um, so everything that we do, because we are publicly funded, has a public face. Our education and outreach team works hard to link science to the East End communities. And we work closely with our Citizens Advisory Committee chair to reach out to all of our communities. Uh, we have an extensive online presence and we try very hard to um, continually liaise with our communities. In 2022, we're hoping to have an in-person State of the Estuary Conference, uh, which was put on hold. We had an online conference this year, but we're really hoping that we can get back to uh, an in-person State of the Estuary Conference in 2022. Again, strong partnerships and engagement. We operate a fishing line recycling program, um, which we call monofilament recycling, where we have various stations on this map um, where people that are fishing from the shore can uh, dispose safely of their monofilament fishing line. Um, and we work on wildlife monitoring. Um, we started in conjunction with SeaTac and other partners. We started the Wildlife Monitoring Network uh, in 2019, 2020. Um, and this brings together all of the wildlife monitoring that Long Island partners do. Some of these are horseshoe crab monitoring, alewife monitoring, terrapin monitoring, and my personal favorite otters, which have been expanding on Long Island, if you haven't heard. Um, and it is very, very exciting uh, for us to watch this happen, but also highlights the fact of disjointed natural properties um, and the dangers that the animals face while trying to go between habitats. So our current work, as I said, is guided by our conservation, comprehensive conservation management plan. This is our strategy document for watershed management for the next decade. We're really proud of this. We had an extensive two-year stakeholder-based process to put this document together, um, which really helped us to be confident that our goals and our actions are, are really have a lot of public input too. That was really important to us. And, <coughs> excuse me. And we look forward to con continuing our work um, for instance, like the Living Shoreline Project, which I talked about before. A follow-on from this, in the area, we've had groups of homeowners approach us about how to remove their bulkheads and make living shorelines in their areas. We'd like to help people be able to do things like this. This is often a minefield of unknown territory, both for permitting, for insurance purposes, for funding, um, you know, when you have things like public funding, state or federal government, they're used to giving it to one entity. If you have five homeowners, how does that work? So we're really working with people that are interested to be able to make these things work. We have a joint proposal with Sea Grant to New York State to create a manual of living shoreline alternatives, uh, which will include some of the projects I talked about and some of the other work that Sea Grant is involved in. And we've done a hardline, a hardened shoreline assessment. Uh, that was the work of two Stony Brook students uh, in their GIS certificate. And they updated work that was completed uh, in 2001, maybe. Um, and it really showed a fourfold increase uh, in linear feet of bulkhead in the Peconics, which is something we really need to start addressing. Some other things that we're doing is our solute transport model. Uh, without getting into the technical nature of this model, this is a groundwater fed system that we have in the Peconics, and we have a high level of nitrogen pollution. Um, what we see is delayed travel times, uh, depending on where you are in the watershed. So what this model is uncovering and will give us is exact travel times of historic nitrogen pollution into the estuary. Um, and what this means is that there will be areas where we can do everything we can now to prevent nitrogen pollution, 
but we still might see things coming through the system that was pollution from 20 years ago. And we will have to learn how to mitigate that. Um, and so we're finalizing scenarios and data sets with that model before we'll move forward with uh, next steps. And we are um, just starting the engineering designs for a large stormwater management project in Riverhead at Meeting House Creek. Uh, we're very excited about this. Meeting House Creek has long been targeted um, as a, uh, a place that has low water quality. And we're happy to start work on do some stormwater management. Again, this is also an area that has historic nitrogen loading from agriculture. Um, so we're hoping that this um, will help abate some of those issues. Um, that was just a snapshot of the conceptual designs, but we are now into the engineering designs. So those may change. Um, and we are, this has finally come and is starting an EcoPath EcoSim model, um, also through Stony Brook and uh, Bob Serrato and Mike Frisk are helping us to do this. They're looking at all of the fisheries data that DEC has taken for the past 25 years, along with other um, reliable data, including Suffolk County's water quality data. And they're going to develop um, an EcoPath EcoSim model for us to look at things like trophic interactions um, and keystone species in our watershed, or sorry, in our marine waters. And we do a lot of policy-based work. So we help to create the intermunicipal agreement. We work closely with organizations like the Pine Barrens Commission. Baconics are actually uh, listed in the Pine Barrens Baconic Bay System uh, Maritime Reserve Act. And so we do work with our partners at the Pine Barrens. Uh, we sit on the New York State Ocean Acidification Task Force. Uh, we assisted and are part of the committee, were part of the committee for the aquaculture lease program and continue to be part of the review committee. Um, we sit on the Suffolk County Coastal Resiliency and Sea Level Rise Task Force, and we headed up the Baconic Bay Scallop Technical Review Committee. So where are we going in the future? Our comprehensive conservation management plan identified many research priorities. I've listed just a few here. Uh, looking at localized hydrodynamic models and places of subaqueous freshwater discharge. Uh, as I said, it's a groundwater fed system and there are many places where fresh water seeps in underwater. So looking at where these are, what are the benefits of those areas and are these points of pollution into the system? Uh, expanding our pathogen monitoring. So we wanna know more about sources on a subwatershed scale to enable con comprehensive management of the input of pathogens as well, and specifically looking on information of wastewater outfalls. There are the towns had identified um, sort of storm drain outfalls as issues um, in their towns. So we would like to map those and get a real understanding of where they are throughout the estuary. Um, we would like to more fully understand atmospheric deposition of ammonia um, and develop better information about mercury deposition and its implications for human health. Um, we focus on eelgrass habitat continually, and we hope to evaluate the success of wetland and shoreline restoration projects. Um, we would like to move into zooplankton surveys to monitor spatial and temporal trends, and to continue and expand our alewife monitoring as new fish passes come online. Uh, so in summary, we bring applied science to inform decision-making. We are a connection between academia and our communities and we are novel national network on Long Island. So everything that we do, we bring back to the other 27 NEPs and we share ideas and we see what's worked in some places and what's worked in others. And can we replicate successful things in our watershed um, and what, what is worth trying to replicate? Um, and we have a great ability to leverage funds. Every dollar a national estuary program spends of federal money, $22 is contributed um, by NEPs across the country. That is it. Does anybody have any questions about the Peconic Estuary Partnership or the National Estuary Program? Yes? One more topic, but that's okay. Um, we're on the Peconic Estuary in a community called North Sea and North Sea Harbor, mm -hmm. where we have noticed we are actually in waterfront called California's Road on one side. Branches into Davis Creek, and the inside flows under the bridge into Fish Cove, the bridge over the North Road. And we don't have 
much of a exchange or flow of water because of our relationship or distance to the actual iconic where we do get a flow from east to west. Is there anything can be done? Because we have noticed over the past 30, 40 years that the muck on the bottom has been just taken over in certain areas. Mm -hmm. No eelgrass. Did there used to be eelgrass there? Yes. Oh, yes. Mm. So we're working pretty closely with Sag Harbor um, on a couple of projects. Um, and in the town of Southampton and East Hampton, there is ongoing work with what we call identifying culverts for uh, water exchange um, and to look at exchange in the inner embayments. So that's definitely something that somebody at the town likely already has on their radar. Um, and if they don't, I can put you in touch with somebody who should know. Trustees. I mean, we notice um, maybe twice a month we see a, a DEC boat come through mm -hmm. uh, taking water samples. Mm -hmm. But the exchange of water, salinity has changed. It's, it's sad. But the biggest difference is that I've owned this property for almost 50 years now is the, is the eelgrass style. Mm. It used to be a nuisance because it was, you know, off the wash up on the beach and then you break it up with using a fertilizer or whatever. But it's just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So we have had substantial eelgrass loss over the past 50 years. Um, and part of what Dr. Peterson is doing is looking at some of the drivers behind that. Um, water temperature is certainly part of it, hardened shoreline is part of it. Um, and water pollution is all part of that. And some of the work that, he, that he's doing is trying looking at the places that it existed before to see what's causing exactly the loss and if it can be brought back to those areas. Um, eelgrass is a tricky topic. Joyce, maybe I'll close this in the questions in the chat. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I have one. I have a very yes. local question. So we have um, we have a, a um, I don't really know much about I don't know, maybe you even covered this, I came in late, but um, we have a a uh, town um, marine project um, um, at the site of the old lobster inn. Mm -hmm. I believe that they were I haven't really heard any news about this except that the restaurant is open. But um, it was planned as a um, as a marine facility with the shellfish out here. And I was just wondering what is um, what, what is your point of view at the current Estro program for that project? Like, are you do you see any do you see that as a harm or or good to the overall health of the estuary? And if you do science here, what do you expect to learn from science? So I'm unfamiliar with the project. The town is putting in a shellfish hatchery. That's what was in the news like a few years ago. Okay. Um, that, so I know the site, but I, I'm unfamiliar with the, ta the town's plans or if they have completed. I mean, I'm not aware of a shellfish hatchery that exists there. Um, do I think a shellfish hatchery is a, a good project? I do. Um, uh, and there's many types of science that could occur in a site like that, whether it's uh, looking at, you know, viability of clams and oysters, whether it's looking at if there are harmful algal blooms in the area, at the sediments in the area. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be explored. A question from the audience asking if you do any work um, with invasive species monitoring? Uh, so we don't monitor invasive species. Uh, DEC and the Long Island Invasive Species Group uh, does monitoring and mapping of invasive species on Long Island. Uh, we do certainly um, keep ourselves aware of it and sometimes participate in partner uh, events to remove it. But um, in general, while it is certainly an issue, um, we don't have the capacity to monitor that. We have partners, organizations that are dedicated to that. And Joyce, I have a question. Um, the zooplankton studies that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, 
I've, I've always been surprised that we don't have more zooplankton monitoring, which Shinnecock Bay, as far as I know, does not have a program. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this is a new program out here on the East End, but it's critical to address so many questions, including um, uh, fish, fish larvae, fish eggs, and, and what's kind of going on out in Peconic Bay. Um, who are you working with on that? Are there any primary uh, investigators in SOMAS or elsewhere that... Um, so we haven't actually started work on zooplankton yet, but it was identified as a research priority. Um, so it's something that we would like to initiate in the next eight to 10 years, certainly um, in the Peconics. Is that for shellfish larvae or ichthyoplankton or anything particular? Or so there's nothing particular. It was just identified that that's certainly an, an avenue we should be exploring. Okay. I'm hoping that the results of the ecosim ecopath model um, will give us some starting points um, we are also looking to potentially do um, an oyster aquaculture uh, impact review that will have a heavy play of, of benthic and what's happening with benthic. So there's, you know, a couple of, of ways to sort of pinpoint how we go down that road. Great, thanks. Okay, you got a question? Um, I just want to go off of the suspension of species. So mm -hmm. What would be the plan if... Um, there were invasive species that were directly affecting any species that you were monitoring. Would you work with like another, um, like would you partner up with somebody to like monitor that together? Or? So it depends what it is. I mean, we certainly have invasive species now. We have invasive species that are problematic. Um, usually the DEC does the lion's share of keeping a database on that. They are who you would call to report that information. Um, it, Certainly, there's an effect on native populations now. Um, we don't have the capacity to go out and try and remove the invasive species, but we, in a, in a situation like that, we work hard to facilitate, um, much like we did with the scallops. I mean, we don't have the capacity. You know, I am not you know, able to solve that problem, but we can bring all of those people into a room to share the data and to try and come up with solutions and to understand what's happening. Um, and so our role would likely be facilitation. Yeah? Um, on the pie chart for restoration, you have that mighty Wilson. What do you do for restoration in that case? Because I know in our class we've talked about it and we've said that it's been an invasive species. So that's a really good question because historically, um, see if I can find that slide. Historically, uh, ourselves and other organizations would have targeted and carried out Phragmites removal um, as part of a restoration effort. And so we list it here because it was done as one of, or part of our 27 habitat restoration projects. Um, in general, we no longer expend time and energy on trying to just restore or get rid of Phragmites. Um, it's often a futile effort. Um, and there is some science out there that says Phragmites um, offers some potential habitat and coastal resiliency benefits. Um, so we are, you know, thinking strategically as we move forward about doing that. When we do wetland restoration now, we focus on the hydrology. Uh, oftentimes, Phragmites exist because there has been a shift in the system and the hydrology is altered. And if we can create the right hydrological conditions um, and sometimes accompany that with planting native grasses like Spartina, um, that is a much better alternative. Um, to remove Phragmites requires, you know, extensive excavation of sites, which um, is just not practical. I mean, it's extremely costly um, and not always with the benefit that you want because they will come back in two years. Sure. Yeah. Not by on top of yet, but uh, are you aware of anyone or any entity that's monitoring uh, absolutely. So Dr. Matt Sclafani, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, heads up the Horseshoe Crab Monitoring Project for Cornell, and he works in conjunction with DEC, who looks at Greater Long Island. Um, and we uh, are in charge of one site at Squires Pond every year. 
um, to monitor and tag horseshoe crabs. Um, this endeavor has been going on for over a decade and there's quite robust information about the horseshoe crabs. It's timely that you say that. I just had a conversation today about what our next steps are on uh, starting to plan how we can be involved for next year. If it's something you would like to volunteer for, they look for community volunteers to come out during the season, which is in the spring. That might be interesting again, but what, what are concerns? So it is Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, and I can give you the website address um, afterwards if you'd like. Thank you. Sure. Hello, this is Judith, Judith Weiss. May I ask a question now? Hi, Judith. How are you? Yes. Hi. Uh, I, it's really some comments about what you said about Phragmites. I totally agree with you about the expense and the fact that it comes back. But I would like to point out that there's been literature for the past 20 years showing very important ecosystem services performed by Phragmites and that there's going to be quite a bit of discussion tomorrow at the SURF meeting, the Coastal Estuary and Research Federation is meeting this week. And tomorrow there's going to be a session about invasive species and many papers being uh, focused on Phragmites and talking about the positive effects it has. Um, and there's also a, a series going on of webinars sponsored by NOAA on Phragmites in particular. So it's, it's time for a, a sea change about attitudes uh, for, on Phragmites. The, the most particular important ecosystem service right now is that it enables marshes to elevate faster and potentially keep up with sea level rise. Uh, we did a study in New Jersey surveying what was known about our coastal marshes in New Jersey. And the only marshes that were elevating equally fast were two Phragmites dominated marshes. All the Spartina dominated marshes were not keeping up with sea level rise. So uh, I think the sea level rise situation because of subsidence going on in our area, uh, Long Island marshes and New Jersey marshes and New England marshes and other mid-Atlantic marshes should all be in the same boat. And um, it's time to, to stop removing a plant that could potentially be the savior of many of our tidal marshes. Yeah, so I would agree with that sentiment, Judith. And I think that what I said was we moved away from frag removal um, and we are moving into a realm of not just for marsh migration, but um, there's some work been done on just their better resiliency against storms. Um, oh yes, that's that too. They, they offer differing habitats um, to Spartina. Um, so, you know, as I said, it's listed on the slide because it happened historically, but we are, are not um, actively partaking in Phragmites removal. Okay, well, I, I advise anybody interested to, if they're signed up and registered for the SURF meeting, Tomorrow there's there's sessions and then there's also this whole series going on um, from NOAA webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, let me jump around here. Sorry. <laughs> if there are no more questions, we'd like to uh, thank Joyce for presenting tonight. Thank you all for attending. And again, please uh, remember to join us in December for our final seminar of the semester, uh, Dr. Joe Warren. Thanks all. Thank you.